Thank you for coming. I'm Jim Hyde. I uh, live here in Healdsburg. I have a company called Urban Green, and I'm working with uh, Bill Silva and his team at GHD, which we'll introduce in a minute, to uh, develop the Healdsburg Avenue improvements. Um, how many people were here at the last meeting? I guess I should say how many people were not here at the last meeting. Okay, so we just got more. Okay. So um, just a couple of things before we get into tonight's discussion, which is this, this is a second meeting. Just a couple of people so you know who is here from the city. Um, David McCallion in the back, assistant city manager, soon to be city manager in about 30 days, give or take a few. Terry Crowley, uh, public, works, or public uh, utilities director. Brent Salmi, uh, public works manager, right? Okay, and Barbara Nelson. Planning director. I don't forget anybody is else. That on, Jim? Is it? I just want to make sure. Everybody here okay back here? Yeah, there's a light. Yeah, I guess it's on. Okay. Um, and then for the uh, the project team, I mentioned Bill Silva from GHD, who's the principal in charge of this project. Frank Penry, who you'll be meeting tonight, is going to be the bulk of the presentation. He's our roundabout expert. And uh, Steve Grupico in the back, who's also with GHD, and it looks like. Laura snuck out to watch the game, is that right? Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll call her out on that later. Um, so real quickly, uh, that's our team. Okay, so what are we gonna do tonight? I just wanna do a quick recap of what we did last time. Looks like most of you were here, but because there's a little bit of a gap, there were some, I think, some important messages that we were trying to relay and it's always good to kind of go back to that foundation, just a couple of minutes on that. And then, uh, Frank, is the focus of this meeting is really what we've called roundabout facts and myths, or myths and facts, but it's really kind of a clever way we thought to uh, address a number of the questions and concerns that we've heard you know, over the course of this project all the way back to probably 2003, but uh, as a part of the exit survey that we got last time, and I'll touch base on that. And then we'll have some time for question and answers. And so we've, we've, we're planning to be here till eight. If we happen to get done a little bit early and catch the tail end of the game, that's okay. But uh, the goal is to uh, be done here in the next uh, two hours. What am I doing wrong here? Other direction? There we go, okay. So um, again, just to put this in context, this is the second meeting uh, as a part of this effort. And the effort, even though tonight is focused on the roundabout, the roundabout is one component of a much larger project, which is really all of Healdsburg Avenue from Exchange Street up to the five-way intersection. So it kind of starts down at McDonald's, culminates at the roundabouts, a lot of complicated issues along that path, including undergrounding utilities, uh, repairing and upgrading the Foss Creek culvert, uh, upgrading uh, underground utilities so that there is capacity for future development on either side as those lands eventually get redeveloped, and then uh, the improvement of Healdsburg Avenue, so with a uh, specific focus on what was developed as a part of the Central Healdsburg <laughs> Avenue plan, or what's called CHAP, to uh, make it much more pedestrian friendly and accelerate uh, the investment, reinvestment into that area and the development of that as a natural extension of downtown. So, we have six meetings planned. Uh, this is number two. The next meeting that is scheduled is December 3rd, uh, which is really gonna have a much more of a design focus and it will be much more of a workshop than a presentation. And then we have scheduled three meetings for the spring, dates to be determined once we get through the holidays, kind of see where we are in the engineering design. And those will roughly cover uh, some of the preliminary design options, which will be another workshop. There'll be another session on how the roundabout will actually function in the design. And tonight's kind of some of the general uh, attributes of roundabout design and why, uh, they, why a roundabout was selected to resolve the five-way intersection complexities. But the meeting in the spring will be to talk about the specific design that's been selected and how that will work. And then the last one will be to present um, the final solution both the, the engineering side of it as well as the pedestrian and urban design improvements. So tonight we'll do this. I think I already did that, right? Okay, so just a re quick recap of what we talked about last time. And the, what we were doing last time was really setting the stage 
uh, for this project, both in terms of what the scope of the project was, but more importantly, how we got to the place that we're in tonight, which is talking about the detailed design of a roundabout. And um, I bring this up because one of the comments that we got in the exit survey was, gee, you did a workshop last time, you had 80 people show up, and 80% of those 80 people, so 64 people, said the roundabout was a solution. That seems like a fairly small number in a town of 11,000 to make such a dramatic decision. And the point was that, that was, there was not just one workshop that came to the conclusion we need a roundabout. There's been about a decade or longer process that has led to this conclusion. And it really builds on uh, what I spoke about last time, which is, I think, a history in Healdsburg of very thoughtful uh, discussion, good leadership, and really kind of progressive ideas of how to improve the public realm, functionality, uh, the quality of life in town. And so we're citing, you know, how uh, last year Healdsburg was uh, recognized as the number two small town in the country to visit. Uh, the, the work that's been done on the Memorial Bridge in terms of saving that and then restoring that, I think in some ways is a landmark example of how the communities come together, had a thoughtful discussion, I think ended up with something that will be quite iconic and important for the character of the town. And so just kind of the way that the town works and a lot of people to be applauded for that. This process that we're in right now is kind of a continuation of that. Um, but this is not a new idea, and we walked through last time the history of some of these decisions, some of the forward planning that has been done by the city and by the citizens to lead uh, Healdsburg to be what it is today. And it goes all the way back to 1982, the RUDAT study, which really laid out a series of growth scenarios and growth options for the community, which in many ways has been executed very, very well, leading to where we are. Uh, in 2003, there was a study done called the Gateway Revitalization Project, which looked at uh, the major gateways into town and what should be done. And one of the um, primary conclusions out of that was that the five-way intersection would probably best be resolved with a roundabout. In 2011, the general plan was updated, and there was a specific uh, study area created for the CHASA planning, the so-called Central Healdsburg Avenue study, special, special study area, or CHASA which resulted in the CHAP, um, and that was uh, really focusing on uh, the potential for a roundabout at Mill and Healdsburg Avenue, as well as how to properly develop and set in place the policies and the capacity, both from a utility standpoint and a zoning standpoint, for uh, intensification and development of the land, primarily the, um, the new forest site when that came to market, as well as the stuff the land the Humphreys now own as um, that has uh, the antique shops on it. So really setting in place the long-term vision and framework to allow that to grow kind of organically when the time and the market is right. And so all of that then was culminated with the CHAP plan, which was adopted last year, which laid out very specific framework, laid out a series of recommendations, which included the roundabout, uh, laid out a series of design guidelines, <laughs> did a number of estimates for what the infrastructure requirements would be to kind of realize the plan, and then that was approved, a full environmental review was done of that document, and it was adopted by the City Council. Now, one of the things that I'd say was really important about that study was after we got through all of that, and it was about a two-year process, a lot of public meetings, uh, a lot of work with a steering committee, which was led by a number of both, uh, had a number of council people, planning commissioners, and uh, uh, just citizens here in town, but at the end of that, the question was, okay, we've done all this planning work. How do we actually kickstart this? What's the kind of catalyst action that the city could take to unleash what has been identified as the potential of this area? And everything came back to fixing the five-way intersection. There was a, it was seen clearly as a barrier psychologically and physically for getting people to move from you know, the success that we're seeing in downtown and all of that area to what would potentially be developed south of that intersection. It was obviously functionally a problem on the afternoons when you've got all of that traffic movement trying to move to the west and to get West Dry Creek Road. And it obviously didn't present the best uh, arrival sequence into town for people that live here and for our visitors that come to town now in increasing numbers. So the notion was that if we could fix that intersection and the town had the ability to kind of invest in fixing that intersection, that would then unleash and unlock the potential for private investment to begin occurring on the lands around the side. And that's really been, that thesis has been supported as we've had conversations now with a number of the private landowners that they're kind of waiting for that piece to happen and then they have people that they're anxious to kind of get going on on their private lands. 
So that brings us to here tonight, which is to really talk about that catalyst action, even though we're looking at the entire corridor, the catalyst action is really the improvement of that intersection. So, as I mentioned, uh, we're here talking about the roundabout. I know there was a, there was a number of comments that were raised uh, throughout both casual conversation as well as last time about, boy, this is a, it's a really expensive project, uh, you know, big, big project, but it's not a project. The roundabout is the thing that probably catches the headlines because it's gotten, you know, it's been a somewhat notable uh, concept up and down uh, 101 in various towns. But there are a number of things that this project actually includes. Some of them, like the roundabout, will go through uh, concept design like we're doing, detailed design and construction. Some other ones, like the Healdsburg Avenue improvements, which may include narrowing the street, pedestrian improvements, street trees, et cetera, may only go to the concept design, awaiting uh, investment by the private landowners. And then the undergrounding of the overhead utilities, as well as upgrading of the underground utilities, will be required at some point and all of that is being sorted out. So the roundabout is kind of the, it's the poster child for this project, but it's not the only piece of the project and it's also the first piece that's probably going to be visible and touchable relative to what's coming out of CHAP. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with this, but okay. <clears throat> All right, on your chair, there is an exit survey, and this is really important. I really hope that you will take a minute, uh, just hold that, you can fill it out when you leave, but we really take this seriously. Last time, we had about half the people that came. We had about 50 people last time, by the way, those of you that were here. We got about half of them back, and we really used those as a way to just, first of all, make sure this process is working, uh, people are getting the information that they want, but also to understand what uh, people are hearing that they like, and more importantly, what are they hearing that concerns them? So some of the things that we heard last time uh, that people really liked, and this was surprising, the first thing, that probably the thing that got the most support was people were really excited about the idea of undergrounding the overhead utilities in that corridor. I think it's just kind of a visual issue, but that got a lot of support. People didn't, didn't know that was part of the project. They're actually pretty excited about it. Um, the other thing was just upgrading Healdsburg Avenue, and that was an important takeaway from the meeting. It's also been an important part of any of the conversations that I've had with various stakeholders. Everybody, I think the one thing that everybody agrees on is that that entry experience could be much better and we should be doing something about it. And then the idea of actually potentially improving Foss Creek over time, assuming that you know, it works with uh, willing, willing seller, willing buyer kind of land, there's some land, private lands in that area, but there is the potential for Foss Creek to kind of come out from under the cover at that point and actually become a significant part of that entry sequence and maybe even a recreational amenity uh, kind of passive park within the town right there at the roundabout. So people really like that idea a lot. Let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, no. <clears throat> Okay, more importantly, what were people concerned about? So this was good. And, and the thing that, um, I'm gonna go drop to the bottom because I thought what was really interesting is the majority of the people that filled out the survey said under the heading of what, were, what did you hear tonight that gave you the most concern, the majority of people said, I have no concerns, which was, I thought, great support for what was going on. So the fact that somebody would actually take the time and say I'm not concerned was good. But there were a, a number of individual comments uh, they, so there were very few that kind of clustered, but the first one was some of the functionality issues. If you narrow Healdsburg Avenue and you got a median in there, how do I actually turn left if I'm headed, headed north? So Frank should talk a little bit about that. How will the roundabout work is obviously the question we hear time and time again. How was the traffic analysis conducted that actually led to the conclusion that the roundabout was the best solution? And there's always a question about, well, you put a roundabout in there, we'll build big trucks, we've got big lumber trucks, we've got great trucks, we've got emergency vehicles, will they be able to get around? And then uh, there were some other questions about the uh, cost and, and how the project would actually be repaid over time. What were the impacts of the right-of-way? Is, is there additional land that's going to need to be acquired? And then um, there was a uh, concern uh, just about the amount of what people have heard in somewhat of a... I think people were concerned about the NIMBY uh, expressions that they've heard from various times and they really wanted to see it go forward. So they're actually in some way supporting the project and their concern was the amount of opposition that they'd heard casually. So again, I thought that was a pretty good uh, support. So uh, with that, 
I can get back to the final one here. In fact, I think you're up, so I'm just going to let you. There we go. Is that it? That is it. Okay, Frank. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, make sure I get this uh, extended up as much as I can. Is that is that working? I'll lean in toward the mic. You can pull bit. it out too if you want. If that helps. Yeah, right. I talk with my hands. Mm -hmm. I have a problem. Uh, so what we thought of here is trying to come up with a creative way of talking about the elements and design <laughs> consideration that goes forward with the roundabout. Uh, I'm the first engineer in my family, so as as at home, uh, these kind of conversations uh, usually my parents or my family glaze over a little bit. And so I wanted to keep this uh, uh, fresh and, and, and exciting for people. And so uh, what we did is we came up with a number of myths that fit with the concerns we'd heard from the community. Um, so the first myth we have here is roundabouts, traffic circles, and rotaries are the same thing. Many people just say circular intersection, roundabout, route, rotaries. And, and every time I hear it, the first thing that crosses my mind uh, Walt, Walt Griswold driving around uh, uh, on a European vacation and saying, kids, hey kids, look, Parliament, Big Ben. Um, and, and that's where we get into our first distinction. Uh, here what we have is a European traffic circle on the left-hand side and a residential traffic circle on the right-hand side. Uh, the traffic circle on the left, very large in diameter. Uh, not a lot of control. Uh, if anybody's driven in Europe or in the eastern part of the United States, you'll probably have had some experience with these types of circles. Um, while they're circular intersections, they function a lot different than a roundabout. Modern roundabout has a lot of design details that will go through, but the first thing I wanted to do was dispel this, this myth that roundabouts and residential roundabout or traffic circles and uh, European traffic circles are not roundabouts. Uh, primarily, there's uh, uh, the, the number of lanes on the inside is a big distinction. How people enter the roundabout in a European traffic circle uh, and the travel speeds um, have a lot to do with the, the distinction. Uh, the residential traffic circle, sometimes these are just the same four-legged intersection you have on any other street corner and somebody will plop in a, uh, a planter or, or in this case, actually a, a raised uh, planter bed and, and just sort of imply that people are to drive around the circle in a, in a counterclockwise fashion. These, again, are not roundabouts. Um, what we do uh, is I wanted to add to the discussion rotaries. Rotaries are primarily a term used to describe a traffic circle that's in the eastern seaboard. Uh, what we have here is a roundabout, uh, a roundabout being installed within a rotary in Kingston, New York. Um, and, and what you see here that's pretty important is that the rotary, uh, you can get an idea for how large of a diameter that is uh, when, you see, oh, when you see the roundabout being installed within the middle of it. So the, the scale at which a rotary and traffic circles comparative to a modern roundabout is, is really incredible. I mean, you can see that the diameter far exceeds two to maybe even three times the, that of the roundabout. So what distinguishes a roundabout? Well, roundabouts require drivers to yield on entry. That isn't entirely true with traffic circles and rotaries. They also have a high capacity and speeds are low, where traffic circles and rotaries the entry speeds are actually very high. There's, there's not a lot of slowdown. Now, there is an exception to this. In, in Europe, modern roundabouts, uh, in, in England particularly, can be used on high-speed roadways. They're used at ramp terminuses, uh, interchanges. And, and the speeds don't necessarily need to slow down so much. But the distinction there is that those are more of a rural environment. There aren't pedestrians. There aren't significant bicyclists at those locations. They're like a freeway rather than a highway or an urban environment that we're considering for this project here. So speeds are low. Crashes are also reduced and minor in nature. Uh, because the yield on entry, you don't enter the roundabout until you have a gap or room to enter the roundabout. Um, 
as opposed to uh, another type of intersection, uh, and actually we'll go on to our second myth here, roundabouts cause more crashes than other types of intersections. I just said that they don't, and the proof is that according to an Insurance Institute study that was done in 2001, it's then analyzed 24 converted intersections in, in the United States and found significant reductions in the types of crashes. I'm calling off a memory here a little bit, and I don't know if anybody's going to be able to see the numbers, but relative in size, you'll see that the uh, overall, about a 40% reduction in overall collisions. Uh, next is about a 70% uh, reduction in injury. Thank you. Injury collisions, and as much as a 90% reduction in fatalities at a roundabout. Again, this all comes back to the fact that there's slow speeds, and the conflict is different. Um, lastly, there's that pedestrian. Thank you. And that was about a 45 to 50% reduction in pedestrian collisions. These, re this reduction has a lot to do with the configuration. So. On the far right hand side you have a standard intersection, four-legged intersection, and there are 32 vehicular conflicts. You can see the red dots outside of the intersection. Those are potentially rear-end collisions that occur as people are approaching the intersection and somebody yields or stops uh, inadvertently. There's a rear-end collision. Everything else in the middle, all those other red dots are right um, head-on collisions, uh, right angle collisions, uh, associated with the turn movements that are done uh, at the intersection. So we have 32 uh, vehicle conflict points associated with the standard intersection, but when we look at a roundabout, we actually reduce that to eight. Significant reduction in the vehicular conflict points. As well, the, uh, the pedestrian conflicts. We go from 24 to eight. Um, and with those, that differential, uh, between the number of conflict points, uh, the insurance agency and other follow-on uh, analyses done in 2004 and 2007 found not only did we see the same types of reductions, but we actually are starting to see even more reductions. And this really has to do with more of a, a comfort level level associated across the United States with, with roundabouts. Um, so dispel that second myth there. Uh, on to the third, which is roundabouts are not pedestrian friendly. Well, we saw the number of conflict points just a second ago. We go from eight to eight. Um, but the main difference here is that the vehicle speeds at the pedestrian um, crossings uh, have slower vehicular speeds. Uh, as well, the driver's sight lines and uh, the direction the vehicle is traveling is directed towards the pedestrian. So uh, we get into some of the sightline discussion later on, some of the more detail-oriented uh, design elements. The driver's eye, as he's driving and approaching the roundabout, is typically directed not only to the crosswalk, uh, the center uh, splitter island, but then also back to the uh, pedestrian waiting to the right-hand side. All of this is actually before the driver even enters the roundabout. A typical roundabout has a pedestrian crossing about 20 to 25, maybe even 30 feet back from the roundabout, the yield line. And so what that allows is multiple things. The driver's first in, uh, need is to make sure that there's nobody at the crosswalk. And then second, once the driver is past the pedestrian crossing and at the yield bar, their main concern is vehicular traffic. They're not worrying about an, a pedestrian inadvertently stepping off the curb in front of them when their primary concern at that point is entering the roundabout, looking for a gap to the left and entering to the right. Uh, when a driver is at the yield line, what that allows with having the crosswalk back is one car who maybe takes a little longer to uh, enter the roundabout, the, sec the pedestrian is able to cross behind the vehicle, uh, the vehicle that's actually at the yield line. Uh, race splitter islands provide refuge. Um, so the pedestrian is actually crossing the street in two stages. They're crossing one direction of traffic. If they're crossing left to right, um, they would be crossing the roundabout, the traffic exiting the roundabout first. Very clear sight lines to a vehicle that's not only circulating the roundabout, but entering from the left. Then they get to the splitter island, the, the median refuge, and they're able to turn their attention back to the right. 
as a vehicle is entering the roundabout. Again, the design is inherent, inherently has the slowing of traffic on the approach. So the vehicle sees the pedestrian as it's going through the, uh, the approach. The pedestrian can see the, the, the vehicle. Now, we titled this one, uh, this myth, roundabouts are not pedestrian friendly. Uh, what we wanted to add to this is that it's also just as safe for cyclists. And, and that's twofold. The cyclists actually have options in circulating the roundabout. Um, a typical modern roundabout will actually have uh, what we refer to as a trail or pathway around the circulating uh, sides of the roundabout, as opposed to just a generic sidewalk. We use a wider width, which allows the pedestrians and the cyclists to maneuver within the same area and circulate. Roundabout, uh, basically a bicyclist, the two approaches they have is to approach the roundabout and exit and take the pathway crossing the streets as the pedestrians do. California law would require that a pedestrian and a bicyclist in a crosswalk dismount and cross the street. That's just the way it's supposed to be done. Uh, as well, a cyclist can actually take the lane. As they approach the roundabout, they would look for a gap between the vehicles, move in, and circulate the roundabout as a vehicle does. This is possible because the cars and the bicyclists are traveling at about the same speed. Um, the roundabout design speed, and I probably should mention that, I say slower speeds, but what we're looking at is entry speeds of between 15 and 18 miles an hour. Um, this makes everything function in the way that we're, we're talking about here. The, the slower speeds, the pedestrian safety, uh, the sight lines, the gaps, all of these things play together and those slower speeds are actually critical to that. Myth four, uh, as, as Jim had indicated, uh, uh, one of the concerns that came up was uh, with regard to uh, heavy vehicles, semis, farm equipment, even emergency vehicles. Uh, not being able to maneuver the roundabout. Well, the large vehicle, we actually refer to this as our, either our largest design vehicle, is a primary part of the design. We want to make sure that not only the vehicle is accommodated through the design, but it's actually a nice little balance that we have what would re be referred to as mountable and non-mountable surfaces so that the truck, and we call it a, a truck apron, is that mountable surface uh, adjacent to the center raised median where we may landscape or provide other types of visual aspect uh, to the roundabout. There is a uh, raised, typically uh, two to three inches. It may even be cobbled or have some kind of texture to discourage vehicular traffic. And so uh, while we're designing for larger vehicles, we still want to be cognizant that we don't open up our entries and open up the circulatory area so that we increase our driver speeds for a, uh, a passenger vehicle. You know, you get a little Mazda Miata or something that wants the little Mini that wants to go through here. Um, we're constricting the roadway and then providing mountable surfaces. Therefore, city bus, uh, the, the tractor trailers, as, as you can see here, maneuvering the roundabout with a, a left turn here on the left. Uh, on the far right, you have a uh, uh, I believe that would be a through movement, and then on the bottom right would be a right-hand movement. Um, so it's a balance, but the larger vehicles are not a problem. They're part of the design. We would look uh, towards any of the, uh, the industries, uh, the design vehicles that we have on the roadway, as well as just balancing that with uh, what the uh, um, truck routes are through town. And obviously this would be a an intersection that would likely have uh, larger vehicles going through it. Uh, the one thing I'd like to add though is emergency vehicles. So that uh, in some cases can be a, a more difficult design vehicle to deal with than a tractor trailer because you're talking about uh, vehicles that are trying to respond in an orderly fashion. Uh, we don't want to have them driving, not always driving on the truck apron. Uh, sometimes these are uh, tender trucks, they've got tanks, there's several hundred thousand so tons of, of water weight on them, keeping a balance and alignment and everything else so that these vehicles can continue to serve the community. We don't want the roundabout to become a hindrance. Uh, we've already started to have some conversations with the, the community fire department 
and uh, this is not going to be a, a problem. It, it can be, depending on the size of the vehicle. Talking a ladder truck or something like that, you just need to know that that's a consideration and we put it into the design. Fifth myth, new drivers and elderly drivers will not be able to safely get through the roundabout. Well, we have our little diagram there of a turn by turn through, uh, through a typical roundabout, a four legged roundabout. Um, but the slow traffic speed um, through not only the approaches but the circulation of the roundabout is what makes it uh, appropriate for, not, for, for a, wide, a wide range of drivers. Um, basically what this does is it allows increased decision and reaction time uh, for drivers. You know, as opposed to a, uh, an always uh, traffic signal. Um, most people pull up to a traffic signal, tune out. Uh, roundabout's very dynamic. It's a, it's a moving queue. People are pulling up and driving through. Um, the next driver in the queue, very open environment, can see the next uh, gap in traffic. And it's not uncommon to see two, three, four cars take advantage of a gap in traffic um, as long as everybody's paying attention and moving through. It actually works very nicely. Uh, so the increased decision time and reaction time is, has to do with the open sight lines that will be provided at a, at a roundabout as well as the reduced travel speeds. Less complicated traffic control to interpret. Um, by that I mean the entry is essentially a T intersection. There's only one movement that's in conflict with them once they pass over the pedestrian facility, the crosswalk, and that is the left hand movement. There's not anybody coming from the right. There's not a situation where they're looking for a gap at the existing traffic signal or any other traffic signal, looking to the left, seeing a gap, but not knowing that the light just turned yellow. And now that left turn that you weren't looking at a second ago is now in conflict with your right turn movement. Um, this, well, a roundabout, is very simplistic in that sense. You look left and enter right. Um, it's a yield. You're not stopping. You're not required to stop. But if your gap and your comfort level determine that you maybe wait for a longer gap, you're free to do so. Directed and reduced sight picture. Um, I was getting to that a second ago where I was talking about the driver being directed towards those visual items within the right of way or within the, the roadway. The pedestrian, the signage, the signing, uh, any of the uh, ancillary parts of the traffic control. Uh, for an aged driver, uh, the amount of turning of the head, not having to look over a shoulder to see what's going on behind you or alongside of you, but the, there's the hands, um, but the uh, reduced uh, angle in which a driver needs to turn their head in order to see the traffic coming from that direction. Uh, and lastly, the gaps in traffic are easier to judge. Uh, with the speeds, speeds are controlled. Uh, a roundabout, and, and I'll get into some of those elements later, there's lots of things that are part of the roundabout design that control the speeds. We say that if we want, we aim to have between 17 and, 20, and 18 miles an hour, we're going to be in that range. And I'll tell you later how um, we're able to do that. Uh, so if you haven't made it to the, uh, the Healdsburg Improvement uh, website yet, uh, you'll find a lot of the information we've, we've put the... Uh, the myths that we talked about here, as well as a number of brochures and other information about the roundabouts and how they'll function, and that will continue to grow as we have these meetings. Some of the information we have here, some of the questions we'll answer through the website. Uh, as well, there's another resource here, and it's called roundaboutresources.org, and you'll be able to find even more information, uh, brochures, FAQ, library webcams, if that's your thing and you want to see how a roundabout in Wisconsin is operating. Uh, you can go here and see how they're driving in the snow. Not yet, but they will be soon. Uh, simulations, news, and much more. Now, uh, on that site, you'll also see um, one of the interactive maps here. Uh, each of those dots is a roundabout design or construction. And so um, the company I work for, GHD, has been involved with, as you can see on that interactive map, uh, a number of roundabout designs. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of information um, that we have, and, and that website has a, a lot of information available for you. If the project-specific website isn't answering your questions, I'm uh, 
definitely invite you to, to take a further look there. So just wanted to touch again uh, back to the roundabout and the traffic analysis. So uh, as we had indicated last time, the, the roundabout when compared with the existing signalized intersection, it provides superior operation, traffic flow, and intersection capacity. This is absolute, uh, uh, there's been a, a lot of analysis done on this actually. Uh, you know, since uh, early 2000, 2001, uh, there's been analyses of not only the pre-economic downturn analysis, which as you could, could guess, maybe traffic volumes were higher there. Projections through the general plan were actually higher then. Uh, newer projections and newer general plan build out as, long, as well as the information from the CHAP uh, have gone into the environmental documentation for this project um, and show that not only is there a, a, an intersection capacity, but reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions because the vehicles aren't stopping or idling, we're actually moving through a roundabout. It's a, uh, very effective at reducing greenhouse gases. Uh, a, an, I want to say incredible because I really believe it is, but um, resolution of the at-grade crossing. When you look at the existing grade crossing and how each leg of the intersection needs to come to a complete stop when a train comes through, um, you know, that doesn't happen a lot today, but it is anticipated to happen quite often, um, either by freight or uh, the operation of the smart train. Uh, with the roundabout, we actually gain uh, a number of features that wouldn't be possible with the existing traffic signal and, and appropriate or safe traffic, uh, a great crossing design. Uh, what we're able to do is only stop the roundabout movements that are actually crossing the grade, the, crossing the tracks, at one time. Uh, what that does is it allows other movements, because we have a five-legged roundabout and the rail going right through the middle, we have a no number of movements <laughs> that can actually still function with the gates down. They wouldn't be stopped. Uh, as well, the roundabout, because it doesn't have to serve traffic in the same way a traffic signal does, it'll recover from a gray crossing operation much faster than a traffic signal would. Uh, readily fit within the existing right-of-way. That's, that's the intention and the way the direction we're working right now to fit this design, uh, as well as future-proof the anticipated growth of the chat. Uh, I, I have that turning movement diagram there, and, and there's a, a number in the bottom corner of about 1,800 vehicles per hour. That's anticipated future, year 2030, with the general plan build-out and the chat build-out. Now, in my head, I know this, but um, what we're looking at is, is average daily traffic. What I just mentioned to you was 1,800 vehicles. We typically multiply that by 10 to get to an average daily traffic. And you see on this graph right here, this is taken right out of the FHWA's uh, handbook, Guidelines for Roundabout Design. And you can find that that 18,000 fits within a single lane roundabout. Um, so the preliminary part of this process to determine that a single lane roundabout would work is, is here. The, the proof, the analyses to get to this point, that's all the shell. That's, that's how the roundabout will work within the environment. We believe that it will. Um, the details that we get into, the under the hood, you know, how many horsepower, you know, fuel injection, all that stuff is, is kind of the next step that I, I thought I would go into. But, oh, I, I have this in here. Has anybody seen the, this is a vid, uh, simulation that was actually used for the analysis. And I, and I want to point this out, uh, that when they looked at the determination of, of a single lane roundabout working at this location, um, they actually operated this, and this through the simulation, through the train. Uh, I don't know. Apologize for that. I should have had it just start automatically. Um, we get to the end. There's a question. Somebody wants to see the simulation. Uh, the point of my bringing this up is that 
the analysis took into consideration the activations that occur as part of the SMART train. Uh, stopping in the station and moving north and then coming into the station from the north. So getting into a little bit more of the details and I really, I, I understand that I'm the only one that really enjoys this. <laughs> um, the design process. We start any good design process with an analysis and, and determining that, that, that what we're moving towards as far as the design is a sound design. And so we're, we very sure that the, the determination, the preliminary capacity of the intersection, we took existing traffic counts and we measured those up, as I indicated, by the general plan build out. Now, when we start looking at this analysis and even into the future, another thing to consider is that since the general plan, how much growth has there actually been? So, I mean, we, we get to build on these years that there's been kind of this slow recovery um, and that the roundabout will have a longer life uh, potentially than, than we're even anticipating here. I say year 2030, um, you know, we look for a 20, you know, well at that time a 20 year design life, we're looking potentially even further out. So, um, so we start off with the, the determination, the preliminary capacity analysis, the size and number of lanes. Then we move through considerations and selection. We get to the bottom when we start checking performance. We want to make sure that those things that we've considered, design elements such as the sidewalks and the crosswalks and the locations uh, and the ability to serve the number of pedestrians in the facilities we have. We have a, a class one path that's going to go through the roundabout, not through the circulating, but around the edge of the roundabout and continue from Foss Creek on the north side to go ahead and continuing down along the, uh, the MUP basically, the multi-use path along the railroad tracks uh, to the station. The uh, entry and exit designs, all of these things, very detail-oriented. Uh, the design vehicle, you see it right there. We're going to consider truck, transit, and emergency vehicles. We're going to select widths that facilitate the design speeds we're talking about. Uh, checking performance. Then we come back. We look at this preliminary design that we have, and we start the process over because once we determine how the speeds look, how the natural paths look, whether there's sight distance, finish with reworking the design. This is a process we go through. Um, bike, peds, vertical design, uh, making sure that it all comes together. I'll breeze through these. I really, um, again, I enjoy this stuff. But these are the elements of a typical modern roundabout. Includes uh, such things as the alignment of the approaches, the sidewalks, the buffer space probably don't know this, but when we start considering the roundabout design, and I mentioned the trail or pathway that will go around the roundabout, we actually separate that from the roadway. You won't actually have a direct connection between the pathway at the corners where typically somebody would cross the street at the corner or the apex of, of two streets. Um, because the crosswalks are associated in another lo location, you'll see here that this is actually a buffer that we provide a, kind of a non-traversable surface so that pedestrians aren't driven to cross at the prolongation of the sidewalk, that they would traver, you know, travel to where the crosswalk is. Um, roundabouts don't have a very high um, level of, of pedestrians not working within the confines. Yeah, this potentially is a shorter distance, but you know you're going out in the street. You're going to interact with traffic and that isn't anything we want. Um, so we, we do those additional things. The buffer, the buffer distance can change based on right-of-way constraints and operational constraints as we get into them. <coughs> the entry and exit day, uh, design. Uh, more details, but these are how the vehicles are actually, this is the, the entry angle and the design is, is relating back to how that vehicle's sideline goes back to the other leg of the roundabout and around the corner to the approaching vehicle. Uh, sight distance, as I indicated, uh, as the vehicles are approaching the roundabout, we, we have uh, potentially some curvature to the roadway to help facilitate the reduction in travel speeds uh, and facilitate the uh, <laughs> the line of sight to not only the yield bar where they would be entering the circle, 
uh, but also the circulating traffic, as well as to any signage that would be on the side of the street or the pedestrian on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, some more sideline issues here. Uh, oh, and I labeled that site distance. This is actually a fastest path, um, and this is where we start to get into how a vehicle really trying to ha get through this roundabout as quickly as it can. Let's say it's the Mini, it's souped up, it's whatever vehicle driving as fast as they can. They get over here and they hug whatever hardscape we have on the, the center median, and then they get through the roundabout here and they try and hug that median, uh, that uh, truck apron, and then exit the roundabout. These radiuses become very important in determining how those speeds are. Smaller radiuses, slower speeds. As well, this, once, the round, once the car enters the roundabout, it's this circulating portion of the roundabout that actually has reduced super, or reverse super elevation. And so uh, the best way I can describe super elevation in the positive is that when you take an exit ramp or take an, uh, an on-ramp to get on the freeway, when the roadway is sloped, to allow you to have that ability to accelerate to get up to a freeway speed, or even just a standard curve uh, of a roadway will typically have uh, a super elevation. And that's a positive super elevation and it keeps you glued to the roadway so you can accelerate and go through the curve. NASCAR, you know, uh, we're talking about, uh, I mean, those are like 60% super elevation, it's really incredible. What we do with a roundabout is we'll typically do a reverse super elevation. And so what we're working is in the negative and we'll, we'll put the roundabout on a, on a pedestal. And as the vehicles enter, they'll now have that feeling as though the driver has that feeling of, oh, I need, I need to slow in order to keep control of the vehicle. Now, we're, again, these, this is not that a 45 mile an hour car is going to enter the roundabout and have that feeling, oh, and, and get lost with the super elevation. It's all very controlled and very deliberate. But that's one of, the, uh, one of the additional items that works towards getting the design speeds we're talking about. Uh, anecdotally, some of the roundabouts that I've been involved with the design of, the fastest vehicle to go through them is actually a bicycle. So um, uh, on the right-hand side, we have the design vehicle. So we're just talking about how the truck can be accommodated through the roundabout with the rear tracking of the vehicle uh, being within that, that truck apron that elevated probably some texturized uh, additional travel space or mountable space. Culmination uh, of, of the urban design element. So it, it really, for me, comes as no surprise that a roundabout at this location was a conclusion that not only the community came to, but the, but the, uh, the group involved with the chat. Because it, it really is one of those devices that is uh, quite adaptable to meeting the needs of the project. It, it has that ability to work within the design, the urban design elements, um, but also incorporate those elements. A so roundabout is really a sum of its parts. Um, as you can see here, uh, we have colored areas of blue and red and, and these actually are, are very critical in uh, integration of the landscaping or other visual elements. Uh, there's some areas here that are no-go areas where we don't want anything to be growing much above maybe five, six inches above the ground. Other areas can have more of a, um, a terraced approach as, as they're approaching the roundabout. Again, we, we have reduced travel speeds, but we have sight distance, and we want to make sure that everybody using the roundabout, pedestrians, bicyclists, and the vehicles are all operating safely. Um, I think we're going to, oh, this is back to you, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Frank. That was great. I, I actually, I followed it all, so you did a great job. So I'm, I'm in the camp that doesn't get into all the details. So, um, so before we go to the table, so we'll just do quick takeaways and then we're going to open it up for question and answer. But I want to go back, if I can make this work. That one? Okay, so this is, this is a great slide. Thanks, sir. So what Frank has talked about tonight is, and hopefully one of the big takeaways for you, is there's a real art and science to roundabouts. And the science, I mean, there's you know, evolved a lot of geometrics, a lot of science, a lot of math. Um, and the art part of it is uh, all the things that you talked about, um, 
the landscape, the ground plane, uh, surface texture, <laughs> signage, lighting, uh, furnishing, and I would argue even what happens, what are we setting up where we've got potentially new buildings to occur, what are we setting up in terms of guidelines for building form. So tonight in some ways was about the science of roundabouts. Hopefully you have a much greater understanding of what makes a roundabout work and um, what are the, why it actually is the superior solution to the challenge that we were given several years ago through the chat process. The next meeting on the third is really gonna to begin to look at the art of the roundabout. And what we're really gonna be focusing on is what is the, the kit of parts, the, the, the language of Healdsburg in terms of landscape and material and signage and lighting that would be appropriate within the science that they have to solve that really makes it feel like it's a part of the community. Because there's no doubt about it that when this is finished, it's gonna be a significant change from what everybody's been used to for how many ever years coming into Healdsburg. So it has to feel appropriate, it has to look appropriate, and at the same time, it has to solve the technical problems and hopefully advance uh, the character and the feeling of town. So the next meeting, as I said, will be much more of a workshop approach where we're gonna be exploring not physical solutions, but really the essence of Healdsburg as expressed in the elements that will inform kind of the art of the roundabout. So I just wanted to use that as a bit of a promo for our next meeting. Um, but the, the key, the key uh, takeaways, hopefully, then, are clarifying some things that, you know, roundabouts and traffic circles are very different things, um, and especially the idea of the art of the roundabout, the science of the roundabout, is carefully calculated to really change the way that drivers operate in an intersection from the way that they typically would operate in the four-way. Uh, th those numbers are staggering, I mean, in terms of the safety uh, component of it. And, and I think um, what's really interesting is that, that you talked about the design speed of 15 to 18 miles per hour. The difference, I was just doing some research today for another project, the difference of a car hitting somebody at 20 miles per hour versus 30 miles per hour is, is exponential. It's almost seven times as much impact. It's not just you know, half as much, it's seven times more. So when you're dropping people down to 15 to 18 miles per hour, it's inevitable that A, they're gonna have less accidents, and when they do have an accident, it's gonna have a lot less impact, whether they're hitting another car or they actually, unfortunately, hit a pedestrian. Um, and because of that, the roundabouts are both cycle and pedestrian friendly. Um, again, a lot of the questions we've heard about is how is this gonna work? There still is a lot of industrial kind of vehicular movement that comes through the town. How's this gonna work? Frank showed, and I thought was, was really interesting, and as you travel around the country and see roundabouts, there is this kind of narrow lane accommodating the big lane, and the narrow lane is one of those ways that you make sure that people do drive slower. It also, I think, keeps back to the art of the roundabout. It keeps it in scale from an urban design standpoint with the community and with the pedestrian, but you have functionally solved the problem of how bigger trucks can get around there by providing that apron, and that apron then and how that gets textured, like Frank talked about, is one of those language elements that we'll be talking about that, you know, how do you express that within Healdsburg. Um, accommodating for all drivers, I was having an exchange with, I think somebody uh, who had RSVP'd about, you know, uh, roundabouts being more difficult for people that are, I think, visually impaired, and I think I, I responded that there's, I've heard a lot about it being uh, more difficult for people that are wine impaired because that's what we hear about, <laughs> how many tourists do we have here. So, but the idea is that because you are moving slower, there's better sight lines, it's clear. Sure, the first six months that this thing's open, there's inevitably going to be some people trying to figure it out. But it really, anybody that's been to towns like Bend, Oregon, which has really used these as a significant part of their traffic vocabulary, um, it just becomes part of the way that people learn to drive and it actually functions very well. And then finally, uh, this was not a rash decision that was made in some meeting, in some back room on a dark stormy night. There's been over a decade of plans and studies and analysis that really got us to this point. And so the, the, the point is now that we've kind of, we've kind of proven <laughs> that the roundabout we believe is the right solution. Uh, we've kind of shown how it's gonna work and operate in the five way se section. So where we go from here now is again, defining the kind of the character and the language piece. And then next year, we'll be coming forward with not kind of the generics of how a roundabout works, but the actual physical design of how that gets applied to the five-way intersection. And then we're gonna overlay that with the character elements that define Healdsburg, and it'll all come together in kind of another workshop where we'll get finally the art and science of the roundabout at the five-way intersection for Healdsburg. And so with that, I think we can open it up to questions. First of all, anybody have a giant score? Three to two. Three to two, okay. Top of the fifth, bottom of the fifth.
<laughs> okay, that's it. That's the really important stuff. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, Jeff. Just been kind of thinking with roundabout, is it better to see through the roundabout to see other traffic moves across the the uh, center of it, or is it better not to see them? Just the current design thinking from our roundabout engineer. So, with with regard to the roundabout, you actually want a terminating vista, and so you want to not see through the roundabout. However, there's going to be these, uh, and I say that. Uh, uh, the sidelines are going to dictate how much of the center can be taken up, as well as the railroad tracks going through the <laughs> yeah, middle. Right. So we do have some competing needs, but it is very important that the roundabout have a vista, an element uh, associated with the center of it, so that you don't think that you can just drive over the top of it. So that is, that is the current state of practice, is to have a terminating vista and not... Uh, uh, I know there's, there's some local roundabouts that were just sort of paved over, not necessarily paved over, but even some pavers over the top and maybe some street trees plopped in. These aren't going to be accommodating to the type of uh, facility that we have here. We want a terminating vista. Um, and how that happens is, is, is part of the next, uh, the next uh, um, meeting. Next session, yeah. Next and I think that, yeah, so that's, those kind of technical parameters will be something we'll bring to the table on the third and then talk about that. Okay, how do we express that properly? But that's a great question. Who else? I saw another hand over there. Um, uh, J James, and then we'll get you in the back. I had two questions. This is a single lane roundabout with an apron, is that right? Yes, sir. And the useful life of it will be approximately... I've given the numbers that I'm looking at, 20 to 30 years. Okay. Um, and that isn't even going to a multi-lane roundabout at that point. What there may be is just some, some potential need. and and. All of these things are really going to be gauged upon, and this is the state of a practice that's changing. The number of roundabouts in the United States is an ever-increasing number, uh, as well as in California. I mean, the state of California proposes to install over 250 roundabouts. This is the California Department of Transportation, not city streets. California Department of Transportation is behind nearly 250 roundabouts in the, in the coming years. They're in the planning or programming stage right now. Um, and so uh, the single-lane roundabout can have elements into the future that would facilitate keeping the single lane. And that may be a flare to appropriate uh, a right turn without actually having to enter the roundabout. Um, and that's, what, uh, that's one approach. But also, our analysis is based on kind of, Calif not California, but US standards for gap acceptance. And what we found is that while we analyze these with very conservative idea of what people will accept as far as entering the roundabout. You have roundabouts that have been around for a number of years in communities. They're single lane roundabouts that function as multi-lane roundabouts. Now I'm not saying that that's what you would have happen, but what you do is you get a driver behavior that adapts to the needs of the roundabout. And so while it was designed as a single lane, there may be enough room in it that there are two vehicles entering and making a right hand turn or not. So yeah. Well, well, as I said, the other thing is that assumes that everything else stays static. So one of the big things in CHAP that kind of fixed but is potential that if there was another on-ramp to 101 South out of West Side Road where it's already graded and or if there was another off-ramp on the northbound side, that would change the number of vehicles that have to move there. There also depends on how quickly CHAP builds out and everything else. So the 20 years is kind of based on a you know, projection of numbers, but there's a lot of other factors that could change, and if you're starting to reach capacity, there's some other relief valves that could probably be implemented so that it could have a longer lifespan. Okay, and my second question was for the pedestrian crossings. What does it look like uh, visually? Is it just markings and on the street and everybody kind of just watches it, the natural sight lines kind of allow the pedestrian and the, and the motorists to see each other, or is it a matter of pushing those buttons with flashing walking signs or, or... So, so with the single lane approach, it's in, in a proper and adequate design, you have the basics of a great crossing. Basically, the vehicle can see the car, right. given the speed they're approaching, and the car can see the pedestrian, given the speed that they're approaching, and it's either a high visibility crosswalk, i.e. markings, but at this point, we don't anticipate any need for an enhancement. I, don't, I can't foresee anything that would preclude the sight lines that we, we believe it's a fairly wide open area mm -hmm. uh, in order for us to accommodate the sight lines necessary for the pedestrian to have 
good line of sight and, and understand that they're safe crossing that, that location. Okay. Let's go to the back and then we'll go to you, Richard. I think you were next, but yeah. Um, yes. I'm, I'm assuming from what we're saying here that the, that the island in the center is a no man zone, no go zone. It, there's no pedestrian movement in there. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's no. There's not pedestrian access or pedestrian use. That's correct. Because it has a railroad track going through the center of it as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that the roundabout. You might say the purview of the roundabout is all the way up to Exchange Avenue, and that will link to utility things and everything that will go all the way up to Exchange. How far does it go to the east and the west side? So the, the, the project, not the roundabout, but the project that GHD is leading kind of looks at the area all the way down to exchange up to just the north side of the roundabout. And do you go all the way to, just in terms of the, the underground utility, goes all the way to, to uh, the overpass? It goes all the way to one. When I was going to mention there's a graph that goes in yeah. look at that shows all of that uh, specifically for each of the phases of the project. But, but it would take up to the, basically the overpass. Exactly. And then it goes another block to the east. Okay. And that may be study only at this point, not actual, you know, trucks digging stuff up and everything else. I mean, that's kind of what's being, but the study part of it is a, is a bigger area than the so actual construction. Part of the no. Right, Bill, you're not going to the train station. Right. No. Okay. All right, Richard. Um, the illustrations were all four way roundabouts. In that situation, how many. What's the signage requirement if you did what you showed there? Because obviously we have to add to whatever that answer, your answer is, all the signage and clangers and bells and operating arms to manage the train crossing. But ignoring that mm -hmm. for the moment, what are the signage requirements to make a roundabout you've illustrated work? Uh, so obviously the five legs, uh, what, what's important to good roundabout signage is advanced signage. Having the roundabout, uh, as you're approaching it, know where you're headed, whether destination-based uh, or, you know, you, number of locations I've been involved with where you have guide signage. You know, if you, you know, the downtown is that way, the station is that way, the bridge is that way, the freeway, back that way. Um, typically, though, there could be a sign uh, indicating which leg of the intersection goes as a direction. As well, the nice thing about roundabouts is because we have those splitter islands on each of the approaches, or, well, it's approach and departure, um, it's a great location to place uh, uh, street name signage as well. So we do that out at the tip. So as you're traversing the roundabout, the first thing you see as you come around the corner is the signage indicating what is that direction. And so uh, the signage really isn't very complicated at all. It's a single lane approaching the roundabout. It's a single lane circulating the roundabout, and it's a single lane exiting the roundabout. So the only thing that the driver really needs to be aware of is where they're headed based on where they're approaching. Um, and, and, and is that? So that, does that yeah. suggest that in those splitters, coming around after exiting one of the entry points, you'll see a sign. If you went all the way around, you'd see a sign for each of the five exits. I do that, yeah. I, I drive around them a couple times. But yeah, you get to see all the signs. And, and, and there's a number of different ways of doing that. That destination base, the direction base, or, or even uh, just the street names uh, indicated. Yeah, my, the question arises when I think about um, controlled intersections for a rail crossings. Mm -hmm. With the uh, klaxons, the arms, the blinking red lights. What the visual landscape, I know you said on one of the slides, a directed and reduced sight picture. There you go. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so I was leaving off the, the so the roundabout, and as a five leg as opposed to a four leg or whatever, was dealing more simplistically to what's needed to circulate the roundabout. Now, when we talk about the railroad requirements, so we will have a gate across each of the crossings of the re the rail, which is only two circular one way round roundabout, which crosses the railroad tracks at two points. We'll have gates across those locations, not at each entry. However, in order to comply with the Emanuel and Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the PUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, we have certain requirements as far as advanced signing for the railroad itself. So 
on the approach, you'll have the cross buck with lines based on a distance and the approach. So kind of a, a good approach is that we may want to try and standardize that. Rather than the entry that crosses the railroad immediately has it you know, back as you're approaching, we're not going to do any marking like that within the middle of the roundabout, mm -hmm. a circulatory area. We don't do single lane. There's no reason for it. So what we'd likely do is on any approach, put the signage that indicates that there's a grade crossing and uh, the cross buck markings on the ground. Those kind of standardizing that around. So, you know, somebody entering the roundabout may not intend to cross the grade crossing. So it's always good practice to make sure that if they do, they, they were forewarned that they will be crossing the grade crossing. So. And, and what was on my mind thinking about this is just the uh, intensity of visual, yeah. potential for visual yeah. clarity. Yeah. We want to be very careful to that. Uh, we want to make sure that those signs that are, are of utmost importance have a higher level associated with them. There's some things we can't get away from. Right. But there is a grade crossing, and so Hopefully what we can do is we can work with the, the visual elements of, of the guide signage and consolidate those. So we have a standardized approach to those exits. And on each entry, there's, there's something. It's typically like a question mark for a roundabout. It's a question mark, and it shows each of the legs coming off. And Richard, I think it's a great point that from an urban design standpoint, we're going to be really focused on. So I know there's things that, you know, Frank's going to say we have to do, but there's things we're going to put, because it is, I've been to some of these that are just, you know, they're awful. I mean, they're just like so oversigned. And this is such an important, you know, kind of nexus of town that getting that right and trying to do it safe, but also in keeping with the town, I think it's going to be, it's going to be one of the biggest design challenges I think we have. There's another question, uh, yes, yes. ma'am, and then, you know. Well, it sounds like we'll be trapped, waiting for the traffic oh. to just kind of let up, and then we'll run across. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's it's actually a really it's a good compromise in in design because the pedestrian, the sight signs, and visibility are there, and and this, like any other crosswalk at any other intersection, pedestrian has the right of way. Okay. So, um, more pedestrians have have a big impact. No, no, you, the, the, there is no requirement to have any kind of indication, signs, or uh, lights, or markings, or anything like that. Step off the curb. Step off the curb, and you're able to, you're able to see. Well, again, we're talking about slower approach speeds yeah. and good side lines. Yeah, yeah. And, and while there isn't that positive control of a red light for the car and a green hand or a green walking man for the, for the pedestrian, this is going to be a very walkable area. I mean, that is the... That's a driver into that, that commingling of the traffic north and south and through. I mean, the roundabout is an integral part of that. And, and really the safest opportunity uh, for that. You're crossing one lane of traffic. It's a very short distance to cross and, oh yes. Because it looks like the crosswalks are right where people are going to be exiting and they're going to be wanting to step off. You know, they'll be coming off the circle and, okay, I'm finally on, you know. <laughs> Those re the reverse vert, that reverse curve, that ma the mounting of the, the roundabout yeah. helps re keep those design speeds lower. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that plays in there is that we, the exit, that, that, uh, that crosswalk can be, is, is typically a little further than the 50. It's at that outer edge of the 20 to 25 feet to give that additional okay. distance between a car that has just turned around the corner of the roundabout and has that, as you kind of described, a straight line to the exit. But that pedestrian is right there. The car is not looking or need to look anywhere else except he is crossing that pedestrian facility. This is, uh, you know, there's measures and things that we have that we can put out in the press, on, on the website, that, again, we're talking about all these elements and design elements, and this is outreach, but it's still that continued. Once it opens up and once it starts, and the people are there, and the cars are there, and the bikes are there, it, it's, it's all... It, it commingles. It becomes. You, know, you look at 
uh, any location, and, and I, a field trip would be great, but when you, when you look at how Healdsburg has, is, is developing, and, and, and as, as Jim had mentioned, this, this really a, a sense of place, look towards other places, Avon, Vail, Colorado, Santa Barbara, all of these locations have roundabouts. I mean, they've, they've found that answer to put it all together. Yeah, I, I totally yeah. I, uh, can we see the simulation? Or oh, yeah, simulation Jeff. Why don't you fire yeah, that up and I'll take yeah. Mel's question. Yeah. Uh, or I'll my view, I think uh, one of the things that's causing some uh, public uh, concern, skepticism, and myths is a lot of people haven't seen a roundabout of this size. They haven't been there and are trying to mentally visualize it. Has any thought been given to taking videos of some of other cities that have comparable roundabouts and posting them on our city's website as well as showing them at, uh, at, at some of these uh, workshops? So Absolutely. people can actually see them in, yeah. in operation with vehicles and pedestrians. Right. Mel, and that was uh, the, the cities, the website we've set up for this project, because it does have a host of elements, there's a lot of things the information we don't want to overclutter, just like the roadway itself. We want to make sure that the important things are out there. The roundabout section in that will have some more information as we've, after we've had this conversation, there is another workshop in which we get further into right. the design and right. we'll have more opportunity. But I really would implore you to do uh, the, the roundaboutresources.org videos, lots of simulations. Um, and, and I can continue to have these uh, you know, is there's a you know five-legged. That's one of the things. Is while we did focus on a single-lane, four-legged roundabout, I, I really could have put a lot of five-legged roundabouts on here. Each one being fairly unique, though. Some have multiple lanes. I didn't want to overcomplicate the design in considering and uh, overcomplicate the discussion when it's really all the same exact design elements. Five well, legs, six legs, whatever. Okay. Yeah, and I think that those those sites, a lot of those sites have it, but we'll make sure, again, the point, we have a roundabout resources page on the website, I don't know if you've been there, but that's meant to be a compendium of all of this stuff so that people can go to it and look at it. So, let's see if I can get this to run. Yeah, there you go. But you can see the red is the train. The train. Just leaving the station. Traversing, you see the car stopping at the grade crossing. Those are the red lines on either side of the grade crossing. You start to see a little bit of a queue build, and some vehicles are actually able to still maneuver the roundabout, and then it's recovering. Those vehicles are actually in the roundabout, exit, and the, uh, the other vehicles go back in. Um, see what we can do to get that on the website as well. Yeah. A quick question about uh, parking spaces north of the roundabout on Hills and Reality. Have you given consideration to how far there'll be uh, no parking uh, stretch to prevent hmm. people from parallel reversing into a parking, back into a parking space on northbound Hillsborough Avenue and blocking traffic? Because we haven't gotten into where kind of the, the, the limits and the edges of the roundabout no, I don't have a definitive answer at this point. Um, however, one of the things I would like to indicate, because I think it was, it came up as a concern, and I don't think I addressed it yet, was accessing not only parking, but even driveways uh, north or south of the roundabout. And, and while a left turn at certain times of the day can be difficult, the one thing the roundabout does is it facilitates a U-turn to be able to head back up. And particularly the north segment, the driveways are on the east side. So a southbound vehicle, instead of trying to make a left to go into some of the parking mm -hmm. areas, can actually just circulate the roundabout and continue north. The same thing with parking. If an on-street parking space is available on the other side, you obviously don't want to make that U-turn in the middle of the street, but you can obviously make that in the roundabout. But no, we haven't, uh, to this point, know how that is going to interface or how far back we need for transitions and approaches at this point. Yes, um, assuming that the, there will be successful commercial development of southern part of Healdsburg Avenue, this essentially is going to become a downtown roundabout. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not a. It's not sort of a, 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 
distribution traffic island. It is it's, it's a part and parcel of the, the downtown furniture. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good point, because I think back when we were doing CHAP, there was a whole discussion of, well, this is the gateway, and it actually isn't. The gateway is actually probably down by McDonald's, and this is an event along Healdsburg Avenue that, like, you're right. I think if, if the urban design and the economic investment in that area um, occurs properly south, that'll be a really important intersection where there's a whole bunch of vitality, just like there is a bunch of vitality around the square right now. So. And I think that's that's going to be one of the interesting, you know, kind of parts of the urban design discussion beyond just paving and landscape. It's how are we setting up that frame to properly create pedestrian movement, get the right public realm, connect the two sides, so people will, you know, I think there's going to be the challenge during CHAP was how do you not create a psychological barrier that says, okay, I've gone to Mateo's and nah, I don't think I want to get down. I don't know what's down there. There's a big gap and all that. So it's like. How do you just want to keep strolling and kind of see what's in, just kind of want, walk through that little splitter island and just keep on going to whatever's happening down at the south end? So um, that's going to be a big part of the, you know, the next, that's the art part of what goes next. But full consideration, I mean, that's, that's where I said, it's the culmination. The, the roundabout is, is part of the whole discussion. It's part of the place. Um, you know, you don't get that opportunity with the traffic signal. You can say you want decorative traffic signal poles, but the design of the stand, you know, the traffic signal is really doesn't get a whole lot of, of integration or play in, in, in the space. And so that's... Well, one last question, and then we'll, we'll hang around. It looks like the, the, the ranks are dwindling anyway, so we'll hang around if you have some questions or want to talk one-on-one. -on -one. So go ahead, Mel, you get the last one. The, uh, I've done a little research on the Internet, for, and I found uh, a number, and I think you referred to one of the FHWA models for roundabouts, mathematical models, and uh, they're relating the capacity and the vehicle entry delay and so forth to the diameter and the approach angle. And uh, you're right, if there's some fairly complicated equations in there. When will uh, some of the geometrics and some of those numbers be known so that some of us who like to dabble in those kinds of things will be able to play with the numbers? <laughs> Not to check your design, but just to, just to support it. Spring? Yeah, I really think that's spring. probably by that next meeting, uh, not, not, the, the, not the next meeting, but the spring. The spring. Oh, okay. yeah. I think, yeah. I think, again, the goal will be we'll have our December meeting, which is, again, kind of larger uh, language discussion of you know, what makes this place and some of the questions that Richard is, sorry, I don't know your name, but you brought up about kind of urban design things. Then we'll go, they'll be doing some design, David Gates will be doing some design, and then we'll come back together in the spring, probably starting about February, April, we should start to have some really applied designs to talk about in the community. So, Okay, with that, um, thanks so much for coming. As I said, we'll hang around, grab a cookie on your way out so we don't have to take those home, and mark December 3rd on your calendars. I think we will do this meeting here. And tell your friends because it'll be a much more engaging and interesting kind of you know workshop as opposed to kind of this data dump. Thank you.